Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a critique of Star Wars The Last Jedi. This video is going to spoil everything about the film, so please go away if you do not want that to happen. For those that do and don't care about the narrator or an introduction, I recommend skipping the intro and heading right for this very time code for the analysis. I've had a monumental response to my previous video, and since it's thematically accurate, I guess I can say you have all given me a huge sense of pride and accomplishment. But seriously, thank you for the kind words and the helpful criticism, it's been amazing for this channel. As this series of videos progresses, I'm going to use footage of Star Wars Battlefront 2, the good one, with media supporting it like clips and screenshots, hopefully then I will be immune to takedowns. Now, I've received a huge amount of comments and I have always been one to read them on my channel, so when facing down over 6,000, it took some time. The most interesting ones, of course, are the ones that tell me that my review, or critique, or analysis is inaccurate on certain levels, when I thought it was clear that I was making a poorly researched rant, but what are you gonna do, right? Titles don't mean anything nowadays. Most people are so used to clickbait that I think they're expecting to be lied to at this point. I have a few goals to reach with this new video. Firstly, I want to create a video that critiques and discusses the writing in Star Wars The Last Jedi, in full, chronologically. But unlike my previous video, this will be without the anger or language that prevents children from viewing it, as many have shared that they want a safe version of my video for their children to understand and learn from, which I am more than happy to provide in this instance. Secondly, I want to respond to those who feel the criticisms of the film by myself and others were unfair. I'm going to do this by responding to the arguments presented in favour of the writing, and attempt to offer an olive branch to those who genuinely believe this film is a masterpiece. Thirdly, I'd like to share with you all how this channel will be moving forward at the end of the series. I have to warn you that my tone is going to be very different in this series of videos compared to my rage, as that is the first video I've actually made of its kind, and what you're seeing now is actually the way I prefer to present my work. Fair warning for those who don't want that kind of content. And for the inevitable question of why do you care this much about a movie, film and game consumption is pretty much my favourite pastime on this planet, and understanding it is part of the process that allows me to appreciate the work involved. Going in depth not only lets me understand mechanics of film and game design, but it helps me understand why I feel certain ways while consuming content. I am happy to share that with you all, and if you can't empathise with this, then I'm sorry, but you don't have to watch me do it. Another thing that many have pointed out is that I equate all issues with each other, as if I'm saying a small change in gravity is the exact same problem as a character being completely out of order. While in reality my work is more about presenting these things to you, you're welcome to feel about them whatever you will. However, I will let you know my personal perspective when the moments come. I would also say that you should watch the film before watching this video series, but do as you wish folks, I will be going beat by beat through the entire script. This series will be split into a trilogy, and it will first cover the film scene by scene with deviations to topics that I feel are important in terms of writing and production, and then once we get to the end, there will be a few meta things to discuss, and finally a conclusion. Once we get to that point, I will give you folks a channel update, and that will be the end. Oh, and for those of you who left comments saying I wasn't standing up for my opinion by putting the disclaimer at the end of my previous video, that was because I actually did get a few things wrong here and there, and it was badly written. It was rushed. But you won't see that disclaimer in this series, nor any of my other videos at this time. I have spent an entire month rather than a simple few days. Are you excited? I hope so. So let's take a calmer approach to Star Wars The Last Jedi. In order to maintain the stability of this video, I will only use screenshots from the film with extra bits to inform the viewer. I will also have footage from interviews and press conferences with Mark Hamill, and these clips will be without context. So please, check them out in their original context if you want more information, or simply make of the clips what you will, as this is obviously all explained from my perspective. Now, Star Wars The Last Jedi begins with a crawl telling us that the First Order reigns. Now why is this a problem? The state of the galaxy has always been important in Star Wars because it gives us the framing of the story as well as functioning as a source of urgency during the adventure. The Empire exists. It's bad. We need to topple it. Etc. It is absolutely a simple prospect. We're not provided some massive essay about the functionality and power, but we understand the premise. The prequels went further and made it clear that the good guys ruled, but they were bloated with bureaucracy. The systems, methods, and lack of real passion from those in power led to fertile grounds for someone to take advantage. 
and despite the scenes being considered boring, the world was built, the stakes were set, and the progression of events were clear. The modern trilogy confused everyone. We were left to assume that there was a Republic, but they really didn't do anything, and the First Order rose from nothing, as far as we can tell. On top of that, there is a resistance force, but we have no idea what they're even resisting. Who joins a guerrilla team fighting against nothing in peacetimes? Why does this force even exist? And if it is supported by the Republic, then why is it so limited? There are ways to explain all of this. Just because Palpatine is dead and the second Death Star was destroyed, it doesn't mean the Empire had no funding to begin again. But it was implied that they were crushed. Something of a history would have been appreciated. Because now our framing is confusing. We don't know what the stakes are. Is the First Order as large and powerful as the Empire was? Or is it even more powerful? Is the Republic aware of the First Order and how it rose? How powerful and far-reaching is the Republic? This is all over the place. So when characters talk about bringing the First Order down, it makes sense in that they are a negative force that needs to be stopped. But didn't we already do this? Anyone who knows of Star Wars has that niggling question in the back of their mind. Isn't this just the Rebellion and the Empire again? But this time, when they don't explain much of the operational history, it doesn't stand on its own, as we assumed they were destroyed, but now they aren't. Does this not unmake the originals, as their work was now pointless? Look, I get it. This is silly to get hung up on, right? Let's just get on with the war part of Star Wars. But for me, and many others, we wanted to have a reason to remain invested in the world. When it came to the original films, we would ask, what are all the elements of of this world. Maybe there are more systems, more characters that could get involved. W what is this empire exactly, and how can they be stopped when they're this large? These questions would be answered by virtue of the scenes. Comparatively, when watching the modern trilogy, we would ask, what is going on with the writers? Why haven't they bridged the gap between the two films? Not only are the questions inherently pulling us out of the film, but they would not be answered by either of the first two films in the trilogy whatsoever. The Force Awakens is inherently a sequel, and it can shoulder the blame for many faults of The Last Jedi, but frankly, these films are both sequels. They both need to respect the history of their own saga. Otherwise, they will be weak at the foundation. Just because The Force Awakens doesn't do enough history, it doesn't mean that The Last Jedi doesn't have to. For example, if the Empire lost their Death Star in Episode 4, as we saw, and then we were told that the Rebels reigned supreme in Episode 5, it would have been incredibly jarring, since we know there is more to the Empire than one space station, or planet, or even fleet. Conversely, the New Republic is knocked out in one scene, and Episode 8 begins where Episode 5 began. This isn't poetically cyclical, it's incompetence. What happened in between? The Force Awakens seems to try to bridge the gap, in that the Republic gets destroyed rather than them just being destroyed already, but they've skipped huge amounts of information. Why not have a trilogy of films in which the bad guys were puny and trying to survive, while the good guys were attempting to crush them at every moment, providing scenes scenes of moral ambiguity. This could add to Kylo's character in that he chooses the losing side because he empathizes with their goals, their morality. Instead, we are left to assume that he probably got attracted to them by their power, their stranglehold whether or not that was explained. One of the most common arguments in favor of this setup is that it's filled in with third-party media, like books, comics, or even a TV show. These things will answer the questions you have in totality. Even if that's true, it's not good for a film to rely on other media to be considered whole. Be an incomplete work is nothing to be celebratory about. To be in a position where you require your viewers to go outside of X to be able to consume X. That's awful. What third-party media should do is provide additional and supporting stories, stories that can help you understand minor elements of the bigger films while being stories of their own. They could perhaps even be strict adaptions. Or they could be completely unrelated, but still comment on the systems in place. This would be absolutely fine, but we don't have enough in the films. On top of this, people have argued that they kept politics and establishment of government out of the film to avoid being like the prequels, because they were just so awful. But to assume that world building is inherently boring is to give up on creative writing, and this is outside of the fact that Palpatine's story is one of the best things about the prequels. A surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. The politics is absolutely a part of that. 
Regardless, this is disjointing, and Episode 7 ends with the First Order decimating Coruscant and other planets that represent the Republic, while also suffering massive losses on their own. Episode 8 simply tells us that now the Republic is gone and Snoke is leading the charge to take over the galaxy. Because of Episode 7, the people who jumped from the original trilogy are confused. But now, even the people who jumped from Episode 7 to 8 are confused as well. It is absolutely possible that it happened, that power and resources sources were moved in certain directions. But no one has told us how, no one has told us why, we are told to accept this and it is rather distracting. But let's shift gears onto a similar topic. The Crawl talks about General Leia's resistance fighters being the only thing left to stand against the rising tyranny of Snoke's First Order. This is, again, confusing on the part of Episode 8 not Seven. Seven told us the First Order was something covert and they were performing surgical strikes, but now, after the carnage they rained down on the galaxy, after losing their superweapon, they still have immense power. Why hasn't the galaxy decided to fight against them? It is confusing because it feels like a European country destroying the United Nations while it was in session, and they used a space laser to do it. But soon after this laser was destroyed, how would the world react to them? There would be carnage for that country. But the galaxy is mostly benign, apparently. Apparently, we don't see any repercussions for the First Order. Another aspect to this is that we don't even know how much time has passed in the world. We know that Rey is scene for scene carrying on, but Leia must have gotten her crew back to her fleet, retreated to a planet for safety, and then got found out by Hux, Kylo, and Snoke on their respective fleet. Not to mention that the Resistance and the Republic are so pathetic that it would seem even the Huts could have taken over with a fleet. Or hell, even someone as simple as the Trade Federation. The First Order are not the only ones with power to amass an army and a fleet, but apparently the First Order are the only faction willing to install their own government, now that the Republic is destroyed. We need to know why the Republic being destroyed is heavily impactful for the galaxy. We need to know why it wasn't hard to do. And finally, we need to know why the galaxy doesn't care. This is now so crazy to anyone trying to maintain continuity. It feels like a chess game was being played and we left for one moment only to come back to all of the pieces being changed or simply moved dramatically. Again, this is not strong world building for the modern trilogy to have. It is hard to be invested in this world when we are so hammered again and again with gaps in the plot. No, I am not referring to plot holes just yet, just gaps in the story that could easily be explained in a few scenes of passing statements, or perhaps a crawl that was longer than one paragraph, but the respective directors and writers want to get their landscape before anything else. They don't want to work for it, they don't want to be responsible for it, they want their scenes before they want their story. Batman vs Superman is an example of the scene coming before the story. Everything is leading up to their conflict by design, the story is written to accommodate it and Star Wars is no different. Ryan Johnson and wanted the pieces on the board to be in a particular place in each part of his story, and his groundwork didn't allow it, so he made the groundwork himself and wrote a single paragraph telling us this is simply how it is. This is not to say that the world building is perfect in the other films, but for episode 8, this is a terrible start. You know, I, I tried to show it to JJ, and he, you know, was accommodating, but basically patted me on the head, gave me a cookie, and made me go away. <laughs> So the film opens up with the familiar plot of Episode 5, which was expected as Episode 7 was very much a clone of Episode 4. The Rebellion is fleeing the First Order as they've been recently discovered by them. The First Order consists of Snoke's ship, the Supremacy, several Star Destroyers, and of course, the incoming Dreadnought. Hux talks about how Snoke has claimed this to be the moment where the First Order will snuff out the Resistance and orders the Dreadnought to decimate the base below. This is all fine, but the writers did not earn their pieces to be in these positions on the board. Like I said, the world building was very weak, but here is our scene regardless. Poe then approaches the Dreadnought with his X-Wing, and they do not immediately fire upon him, despite declaring that he is in attack mode. I haven't seen any counter-arguments for this, and knowing Hux, it really does just come across as odd. Poe only contacts them with the message after they decide not to shoot him. He then tells them that he is Commander Poe Dameron. They would likely know him as the leader of the fleet, the man who took down the Starkiller base, the greatest pilot in the Resistance. I had no idea we had the best pilot in the resistance on board. So, again, why don't they shoot him? Hux has no intention to bargain with Poe. He makes a grandiose speech about power, and so you're left wondering why the writers have created this scenario. In mere moments, we understand why. They want to tell a joke. Poe says he wants to talk. Hux threatens him. 
Poe says he wants to talk again, implying that he didn't hear Hux at all, so Hux threatens him again. Then Poe asks to talk to Hux, the pasty skinny guy. Hux fumbles with his colleagues trying to figure out why Poe can't hear him until an officer lets him know that he's being trolled. The word the subordinate uses is tooling. This then ends with Poe saying Leia has a message for Hux's mother, and Hux shouts open fire. Jokes are complicated in discussion. This is because we can't tell people what they find funny. But when you break jokes down, certain elements can be measured. I, like many others, was under the impression that Hux was not only smart, but he was formidable, and a counterpart to Kylo Ren. This was the impression I got from scenes in The Force Awakens. We shall destroy the government that supports the Resistance, the Republic. Without their friends to protect them, the Resistance will be vulnerable. In Episode 8, Hux is given the wonderful treatment of being bumbling and stupid. He can't even tell when Poe is giving him a crank call. It is unfortunate because you can still write endearing scripts without relying on your characters being stupid to try and create comedy. Now I'll only do this once, but what if Tarkin were alive and Poe were able to speak to him? Ryan wouldn't dare try and humiliate that character, I hope. And so how would this hypothetical situation go? Just for the fun of it, let's run the same scene, but with Tarkin instead. Hi, I'm Commander Poe Dameron. I've come to negotiate with Governor Tarkin. Is he there? Whatever negotiations you wish to engage in, Commander Dameron, I warn you, the best I shall offer is a swift death. Surrender now, and I shall accommodate such a request. Hello? Tarkin? Is he there? Tall guy, kinda pale. Your obvious attempts at humor during a most desperate hour for your comrades only reveals your weakness. Surrender or be destroyed. Oh, hey, Tarky, there you are. You sound angry. I did destroy that giant base of yours, after all. You still not over that? Or do you just sound angry all the time? Charming to the last. Though I would be more concerned with my own fleet if I were you, Commander. We need only a single suitable fighter to wipe out your pathetic resistance. You know, I was going to say the same thing. BB-8, punch it! Open fire! This dialogue achieves the same goal in terms of connecting us to Poe. He is intelligent by stalling the enemy, giving himself and his fleet time to prepare for the inevitable battle. He confidently confronts the enemy leader without fear and feeds into the enemy commander's bloodlust. This also allows the enemy to maintain their dignity. Hux sacrifices his intimidation in this scene in order to create a joke. A joke that doesn't land properly for a large portion of the audience. Hux only realizes he's being humiliated by the time Poe says, Your mother. It's embarrassing. Now I'm no script writer, but my suggestion would hopefully achieve the same goal and leave the characters intact. It's nothing amazing, but I also didn't get two years to change it. We then see Poe is going to dart between the surface cannons of the Dreadnought and blow them up. This is fine. Poe is established as the greatest pilot in the Resistance. We can assume it is like his superpower. Other fighters fall prey to the cannons while he doesn't because he knows them so well. Similarly to Anakin's abilities in the prequels. I'll try spinning. That's a good trick. On top of that, cannons don't always nail fighters immediately, so it's okay to assume that he's surviving for the most part thanks to his abilities. To add to this, as Poe is pulling this off, you could show us that the enemy is also in disbelief and desperation of the character's abilities. Throw in a line from the commander of the Dreadnought shouting something like this. It makes us aware that within the universe, what the character is doing is amazing and one of a kind. He's a hero. Instead of this, we have a very clumsily written line to attempt to explain this scene. The Dreadnought Commander says that the ship is too small and at too close of a range to shoot, and they will need TIE fighters to bring it down. This is ridiculous. The surface cannons are made for destroying these small and nimble fighters. That is their purpose. Sure, they miss, and that's fine. But to say that they can't hit him as a result of their design? That's preposterous. What is the point of the cannons if they can't shoot fighters by design? Is it only to shoot the bombers? Because as the film proves to us, we don't even need the cannons for the bombers to be decimated. How does technology that advanced from the past get worse? The surface cannons in the OT were more than capable of decimating fighters. Watch yourself, three speed full drop. What about that tower? You worry about those fighters, I'll worry about the tower. This makes the scene hard to stay attached to for many viewers as we are now making up some new and strange rules about surface cannons to explain Poe's abilities when it would have been far easier to simply say he was talented. This line is also coaxed out of the commander by Hux, who apparently was unaware of this design flaw. Does he not have surface cannons on his own ship? So why is he curious that the ship hasn't been destroyed? We end up finding it hard to fear this ship because of its own incompetent design. Why aren't there any shields 
shields on the Dreadnought whatsoever that could prevent this as well as the incoming bombing. They stayed true to this in Rogue One just a year ago. Admittedly, Gareth Edwards was heading the project, but as you can see, they're using Y-Wings to try and decimate a Star Destroyer. The Star Destroyer's shields make this difficult, so they disable it with previously established tech, going as far back as Episode 5. So it is possible to work with these things in new films. Because if we take this film seriously, by this line of logic, we are now dealing with the idea that any single fighter is a massive threat to a Star Destroyer in the future of space battles as they cause a death by a thousand cuts. If all that can stop Poe is fighters, then why haven't the fighters been scrambled already? Hux and the First Order arrived about five minutes ago now and they were witness to a fleet just in front of them. It stands to reason that they may want to release fighters immediately, but they only do it in response to Poe destroying several cannons. This scene is already difficult to figure out the motivations and potential of each piece involved. But now we're changing the rules on what each ship is capable of. Poe is then shot very casually by the first fighter that encounters him, which does lend more clout to the idea that he isn't quite the impressive fighter pilot compared to that of Force Awakens' depiction of Poe and his X-Wing. The reason this has happened is for tension and a joke. BB-8 ends up fixing the ship with slamming his head into the motherboard. This would be yet another example of a poorly executed goal. We want to have a moment of levity to solve a potential crisis in a funny way. That's fine. But please don't have BB-8 play whack-a-mole with electricity. It is distractingly strange as a problem to solve. It is beyond that of a video game even. So what would be an easy choice for this in terms of fixing technology in a funny way? Well, just yesterday I fixed a flashlight I was using by banging it on a table I was near. This is a real thing that happens and you can make BB-8 get visually frustrated with a meticulous job he has to perform only to make an angry beep and then slam his controls. Have Poe say something like, that did it, and BB-8 can have a robotic sigh. Again, endearing, rooted in some truth, and performs the task of levity rescuing tension. Like seriously, is shoving your head into a motherboard a real thing? Any of you guys ever done that? Regardless, Poe buys enough time for the Resistance to escape the base, and Leia commands Poe to return to the ship. He refuses because this is a chance to defeat a dreadnought. The interesting thing is that Leia says disengage your fleet, but Poe is alone as the First Order made very clear. However, in mere moments, eight bomber-class ships approach the Dreadnought. The first thing here is that from my limited knowledge, there are already bomber-class ships alongside the X-Wings in Star Wars. They are called B-Wings and Y-Wings. The latter fired proton torpedoes. They are used as orbital bombardment as they can breach shields if used in the right frequency. What we can see, however, are these newly designed bombers that are extremely weak and ineffective compared. Ryan Johnson, the writer-director, wanted to closely reference World War II bombers, and he even showed a film in relation to this to the crew in order to nail the reference. That is wonderful, and it shows a level of passion, but it failed miserably in execution. This is because it didn't need to exist and doesn't perform the task any better than the previous ships. Immediately we see a selection of TIE Fighters blast through one of the bombers because it is extremely slow and lacks any form of armor or shielding, which would beg the question of why are they not using Y-Wings? again. Then the Dreadnought prepares to strike Leia's cruiser, which as far as the audience knew was actually not an option, since if this was an option then you would obviously attack the Radus first which is Leia's cruiser. The main cruiser the Resistance is using right now is the Radus. It is the only one they have left. You should probably shoot that before they can jump to hyperspace. Now there have been arguments against this. One that was popular said, they did not know the base was empty, that's why they shot it first. This is nonsense. Star Wars has already established that they can scan for life at great distance. There goes another one. Hold your fire, there's no life for us. Unless it's short circuited. As well as the fact that as soon as they arrive, they spot the Radus, the only remaining large cruiser for the Resistance. Had the Dreadnought shot the logical target first, the film would have been over, so the writers gave the Dreadnought a false target to shoot first and create tension by threatening Leia's ships secondarily. This threat becomes even more frightening when we realize there is only one bomber left, but how did this happen? Well, half a singular TIE fighter accidentally flies into the base of one of the bombers and sets off a chain reaction that blows 
dispose of three of them. What remains now is one bomber, as we do not know why the other three were destroyed, though we can guess since they are so monumentally weak. The last of the bombers makes it to the target area, but they fail to release their bombs, and so a girl attempts to kick the ladder in order to create enough of a shake to drop the controller for the bomb release from the top of the ladder. This would allow her to activate the bombs. This scene is played very emotionally, and she only manages to pull it off in the last few seconds, destroying the dreadnought. I put it to you, my humble audience, that this sequence is extremely poorly written, and thus makes it very difficult to enjoy from certain viewers' perspectives. Firstly, the bombers are very slow, very large, and very weak. We need these ships to be placed right above the target, which is extremely dangerous compared to the requirements of a Y-Wing or any at-distance shooter. Therefore, you would expect these ships to be resilient, especially to basic weaponry from fighters but they are not. The ships take a very long time to reach the destination compared to a Y-Wing. This is a problem because it allows the enemy fighters to decimate you along the way, and if these things are powerful yet fragile, you would expect them to be at least very fast to avoid being targeted easily. They are not. The ships on top of all of this are very large, providing a huge, slow, and fragile target for the enemies. This is blatantly poor ship design. Why are the Resistance using these ships instead of their normal bombers? The only argument I've heard is that their payload is capable of knocking out a dreadnought where even a whole fleet of Y-Wings are not. This is a fabricated argument. The writers control whether this is possible, not the viewers. There is never a line to say these bombers are the only ones that are capable of this level of damage, and even if they were, that would be an artificial inconvenience to allow the use of these ships. The fact is that Y-Wings have been used to decimate Star Destroyers. The Dreadnought does not have shields. I'm pretty sure the Y-Wings would be fine. The resistance using these ships is a plot hole as we know they have access to what are probably smaller, faster, cheaper, and generally superior ships, and they are not using them. Why is this happening? It is happening so that Ryan Johnson could indulge in his love of World War II-style bombers. The heart is getting in the way of the mind. But there's more. Why did the person who was supposed to drop the bombs just die? There is nothing to show why he's just lying on the ground, dead. On top of that, why doesn't the pilot drop the bombs from his cockpit? Does he not have that ability? He is clearly killed after they are meant to drop the bombs, and if he had been killed in an explosion before they reached their destination, it would have explained his death as well as the dead guy that the girl finds. I think they may have edited this out of place. If you have the pilot die and the bomber person die, it leaves the gunner to perform the task. That makes sense. But it is not how this series of scenes goes. Also, why isn't it voice activated? That would probably be a useful piece of technology here compared to a button. Moving on from all that though, the payload releases and it's actually bizarre. Never before have we seen this sort of method in Star Wars, but this is where we will start to bring in many arguments for the defense of the film and try to respond to them. So, why do the bombs drop when there is no gravity? The responses I've heard for this are, the gravity is from the planet, the artificial gravity is from the bomber, and once they are dropped it passes into space and maintains its momentum. The gravity is from the dreadnought, it's pulling the bombs to it, the bombs are magnetized. So let's tackle this. The planet is far off in a completely different direction. If it was pulling the bombs, they wouldn't fall to the dreadnought. The artificial gravity of the ship could create the momentum required to explain why they drop, though that still seems weak. The dreadnought couldn't possibly create the gravity required to pull the bombs at that speed that they drop. The bombs may be magnetized, that would actually make a lot more sense. In fact, that's some good writing to make up for the inappropriate ship design. However, this would be an example of somebody writing the script for Ryan, and it's not the first example. Now, why is there a gaping hole in the floor of this spaceship? Why wouldn't this be sucking the atmosphere right out of the ship? The response to this is either, you are right, that doesn't make sense, or, there is a force field that protects people from the atmosphere of space but allows for bombs to release, you simply didn't see it. Assuming the latter is true, it is very much a piece of cop-out writing to allow for the visual, as well as it being the first we've seen of this class of ship, so information would be nice. What you could have done is have a little robotic voice saying, Force field activated. Anyway, the amount of time it takes to loose the payload from the bomber means that the first bomb would likely have a chain reaction from the dreadnought all the way to the bomber itself. In fact, this is exactly what we are shown. This is horrible design. How does a bomber survive a bombing run? Are these ships meant to be destroyed once they attack their target? Please remind me why they are not using Y-Wings again. Aside from its own kamikaze aspect, 
It will also allow enemy fighters to rescue the target from destruction by committing suicide, as we've already seen. It's very simple, it costs one fighter to rescue an entire Dreadnought now. And you wouldn't even need human sacrifice, have a droid do it, or even shoot the bombs as they release. They could literally park a TIE fighter just below the bombers, and as soon as they open up, just open fire. So in conclusion, we have ships being brought to the brink and ultimately sacrificing themselves to destroy the enemies in a tense, action-packed scene of survival to prevent the destruction of the resistance. It sounds fantastic in theory, a classic heroic tale of sacrifice, but the writer did a horrendous hatchet job of supplying the elements and environment to make this happen. Ryan wanted the sacrifice, he wanted the World War II bombers, he wanted the tension, and he wanted the relief of success, but he didn't earn any part of it, and so the scene is an utter writing mess, and the bombers being shoehorned in as a result break many of the logistics and rules set in place by reality or by Star Wars itself. The resistance then retreat in a escape through hyperspace. Because of this inexplicable loss, Snoke is angry at Hux and appears as a full-headed hologram on the bridge. He is furious that Hux allowed the Resistance to escape when this was supposed to be the moment they were snuffed out. He immediately drags Hux to the ground and you get a slapping sound combined with Hux screaming pathetically, further reducing his character to a bumbling fool. Hux then tells Snoke that they will not escape because of the new tracker they have developed and the scene ends. Such a small scene, less than a minute and yet it contains such lazy writing. Why doesn't the Supreme Leader know about First Order technology, developed from Empire technology, that allows you to zero in on targets at will? This is brand new for the series as they have always had to place trackers on ships, but now only need to find them and it's over. Since this scene could have been cut, the only real purpose it actually serves, aside from showing the raw power of Snoke, is to humiliate General Hux again, which means his character is almost retconned now. Hux was once of similar standing to Kylo. They had a new dynamic. In the OT, Tarkin was superior to Vader. Enough of this. Vader, release him. As you wish. And every other officer past that was subservient to Vader. This connection in The Force Awakens was new. This was a clash of officer and Sith. Hux was actually set up to be an interesting foil to Kylo and vice versa. We could have developed a competitive nature as well as providing a reason why Kylo restrained physical retaliation on Hux. Perhaps Hux had a relative with power, or he held something over Kylo, or maybe he had power that he had not shown. The mission have no problem retrieving the droid. Unharmed. Careful, Ren. That your personal interests not interfere with orders from Leader Snoke. Regardless, this choice was a real shame. Um, what failure have you ultimately learned the most from? <laughs> Great question. Do you have enough time for this? <laughs> <laughs> Starting with this answer. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> May the force be with you. Finn then wakes up and we get three jokes right out of the gate. He hits his head on the medical scanner, he falls out of his bed, and he's leaking fluids while walking around until Poe finds him. Finn then asks for Rey, which is in line with his character as he cared more for her than perhaps himself, and was injured trying to protect her. The sad part of this is that there is nothing permanent from Finn's injury, nothing to remember or learn from. He was put in a coma by a slice to the spine, only to wake back up. It is almost completely pointless looking back. Is that Abrams' fault, or is that Ryan's fault? I think it's easily understood as Ryan's fault, because it's a setup that was completely removed. Is it a subversion? Of course, I didn't expect a spinal injury to have absolutely no repercussions. But then it receives merit by simply being unexpected. That's how this film works, right? Regardless, we finally get to see Rey. Rey is seen right where we left her, providing Luke Skywalker Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber. And we have a very strange moment straight from Ryan Johnson that tells you so much about his perspective. They play a soft theme to get the viewer in the moment, taking off right where the previous film left us. And then it rises in tension, only to climax with Luke flimsily throwing the lightsaber off a cliff and walking away. This is what I would describe as tone deaf. Others describe it as subversive. Either way, let's get into this. Why was Luke standing there? Why is he already so angry? Why did he just comically throw the lightsaber? Were we meant to be taking this seriously? The scene now feels as though we're supposed to be laughing, and those two tones are heavily conflicting while providing a strong confusion for Luke and his character. 
If Luke looked down and simply allowed the lightsaber to drop from his hands and then he slowly moves away, that would be one thing. But to very deliberately throw it in such a please laugh now manner is jarring. I know many people don't understand why I'm working hard with this point, but it will become clearer as we move through the video. Luke is different. Luke tries to hide from Rey by retreating into what we assume is his home, but Chewie bursts through the door and the first thing Luke Skywalker says angrily to Chewbacca after who knows how long it's been, is, What are you doing here? Ray then translates Chewie for Luke, which is insulting to Luke as a character. Either the writers forgot that the man has clearly known Chewie for roughly 30 years and Ray would know this, or they simply don't care. Either way, it comes across as a blatant misstep in understanding the characters at hand in order to translate Chewbacca for the audience. Luke then asks, How did you find me? Which, if you only watch the movies, you'll barely know how to explain to your family or friends how the map to Luke came about and why it was even a thing, but Ray says she'll explain on the Falcon. This is absolutely Episode 7's fault. I don't blame 8 for that. Now Luke knows the Falcon and Han Solo are almost inseparable and so asks where he is. The camera then slowly zooms towards him, only for the film to cut to Kylo Ren in an elevator. They do not allow us to see Luke Skywalker react to the death of Han Solo. Instead, we only have Leia on her own with Finn and Rey at the scene in the first film. This is so beyond insulting. The emotion we get from empathizing with these characters and their struggle is what binds us to them. To be with them when they fail, and to admire them when they succeed. To steal Luke's realization that his best friend of countless years, his sister's lover, his nephew's father, the man he went to war with again and again, the man who'd saved his life many times. You didn't let the people who love Luke Skywalker feel that pain with him. That is such a terrible choice as an editor, as a director, director, but first and foremost, a lead writer. And I say, because it would carry so much emotional resonance into the next film. For us, his wife, his best friend to witness, instead of two characters that have known him, what, 20 minutes? Too bad that Luke and Leia can't rush to Han Solo's side. I mean, we won't be reunited yeah. and we'll still be too late to save him, but at least we have some history between us so that when he dies, it has a tragic element that resonates into the next film. So we are now with Kylo Ren, and he's going to visit Snoke, who tells Kylo that he keeps someone like Hux around because he can manipulate him, implying heavily within the scene that he feels the same way about Kylo. Snoke shares that he is no longer confident that Kylo is the Sith he saw in him long ago, and demands that he take his mask off, because the mask is ridiculous. Kylo says that he killed Han and didn't hesitate whatsoever, only to be criticized by Snoke for losing to a girl who had not been trained. The scene ends with Kylo destroying his mask and demanding a ship. It is it's strange to suddenly see Snoke in person. You would expect a bit of an entrance like Darth Maul or the Emperor, but never mind. It is also strange that we get no information about finishing Kylo's training, but we do get Snoke insulting Kylo for wearing his mask. Kylo has been wearing his mask in meetings before and has previously been wearing it for a long time. It was shown as a strong part of his character his image. An image that he crafted in order to strike fear into those around him, and it was working. His overcompensation did exactly what he wanted. The Resistance will not be intimidated by you. Where is it? And now Snoke insults him, and he stops wearing it? Kylo's had several scenes with Snoke wearing the mask previously, so why is he picking on it now? And what is more important is that The Force Awakens gave us a very clear example of how much Kylo does not like to be seen without his mask. Now that's all gone. This just seems rushed. The insults for his costume should have come from the enemy, having Poe or Rey insult him about his overcompensation as it would make for an intense development. It shouldn't be the guy who's seen him wearing it for what is potentially years. This just muddies the relationship between these two and makes it hard to figure out why Kylo even follows Snoke if all he does is humiliate him. Kylo is known to respond badly to controlling and belittling figures, but he's okay with it when it's Snoke? It just would have been great to get a better sense of the relationship between these two. This is something that the prequels did quite well with Anakin and Palpatine. It wasn't perfect, but it showed a lot of why Anakin and Palpatine managed to stay as close as they were all the way until Vader and the Emperor. The Death Star will be completed on schedule. You've done well, Lord Vader. Rey then asks Luke to come back and help the Resistance, and he has this line to say back to her. Do you think I came to the most unfindable place in the galaxy for no reason at all? Go away. If you need your character to say they're in a place that's hard to find, 
Don't use a word like unfindable. It sounds like a child wrote it. Luke should be saying things like the most remote part of the galaxy. Or do you think that I came to the best kept secret in the galaxy so that I could be followed? Lines like this, words like unfindable, can often raise an eyebrow in the audience. On top of that, hearing Luke Skywalker so sheepishly utter go away was actually distracting to me. What is going on here? We are then provided the milk chugging scene that fans are so distraught over having to see, and maybe this requires explanation. Luke Skywalker was an impressive piece of cultural iconography, a man who despite all odds and trials pulled through and led the charge on saving the world from a terrible evil. He did this while saving his father from darkness and became a great hero to Star Wars' universe and our own. We've not seen this man for 30 years, and the first thing he does after being introduced is flee from the Call of Duty in order to rush to some morbidly obese creature and chug down its juices after milking it right from the nipples. It isn't that this doesn't make sense or doesn't suit the location and narrative at hand. It is simply a question of why. Why are you putting one of the most iconic childhood and adult heroes, a legendary warrior and inspiration for millions, in the dirt and having him suck on the milk of some sweaty creature? Why? What does this add for the audience? I suppose it answers the question of where Luke gets his sustenance, because there's no other way of doing that. But is it necessary? Such a bizarre scene, it already sets a strong precedence for events moving forward. He is so significantly important to the ne this next film. You have oh. no idea. Well, that's good to hear. Luke then catches a fish to further answer questions about his source of food, and Rey shows us that she's holding a device in her hand. Luke then catches Rey while she's in the Jedi Temple that's inside a tree, and wants to know who she is. They then have a back and forth, and Luke goes from this extremely gruff, no-nonsense disheveled man to cracking a joke here and there, commenting on how nobody is from nowhere, but Jakku is indeed pretty much nowhere. So now we are left to wonder if Luke is actually just being difficult since he clearly is able to engage in levity, or is this just an attempt to keep the script from feeling too dull? Rey then says she needs him to teach her, and Luke replies that he'll never train another generation of Jedi and that they need to end. This is a major shock to the audience. Luke Skywalker is telling us that the Jedi need to end. Luke has now created a huge mystery and there is a blatantly large gap in his development. What made this happen? We then see Leia recovering from the loss of the majority of the Resistance fleet, and the scene moves her into slapping Poe. Poe argues that you should always finish a mission that you start, and Leia responds that not every problem is solved by jumping into an X-Wing. We then see the twin device to Rey on Leia, and it's explained that it'll allow Rey to return to the Resistance regardless of their location. Suddenly, Snoke's fleet arrives, consisting of his personal ship, the Supremacy, and several Star Destroyers. Before they make a jump to hyperspace, Leia points out that it's futile as they were just tracked through hyperspace, which Finn says is impossible. So the plan instead is to fight back and keep moving. Poe moves to the hangar bay while Kylo Ren and his men begin to bomb the ships. Kylo is firing a weapon that apparently goes straight through shields. This allows him to decimate the hangar bay with just two missiles. As much as this is now an established universal rule, it is not a wise one. If all that you need to destroy an enemy hangar bay is one fighter firing two missiles, then this would be occurring in every battle on both sides. We have seen fighters enter the hangar bays at great risk in previous movies, as well as Anakin destroying a ship from the inside in Phantom Menace, which does not make a lot of sense either. Seriously though, introducing this torpedo option will now have to happen in every film past this one, or it'll need an explanation of why it's not. Not to mention we'll have to wonder why it didn't happen in the previous films. The reason it's actually happening is because Ryan Johnson and didn't want the Resistance fleet to fight back in this instance. He wanted them cornered and subsequently chased. He also wanted Poe Dameron to be stuck without his X-Wing. There are far better and less obvious ways to make this happen. Leia then commands Admiral Akbar to bring the ship out of range of the Star Destroyers and this will pull the fighters back. I don't understand why the fighters would pull back if there is enough of them, because they would simply swarm and destroy the ship. Surely. In addition, if the First Order can track the Radis and its location to a T, then why not park very close to them so they can't outrun your ships before you destroy them? I don't understand how the Radis outpaces Star Destroyers. Why aren't the First Order ships faster? Why can't they simply light speed ahead and cut them off? They have several Star Destroyers and backup. These questions will not be answered because this is setting something very specific up. Kylo's men then destroy the bridge and Leia is killed. The fact that the bridge is vulnerable to TIE fighters now, as well as the hangar bay thanks to these amazing missiles, makes it extremely hard to care about future battles. Since these rules are ridiculous and they're going to have to be thrown out the window whenever someone wants to have drama in a space battle. 
Who wouldn't open a battle by sending their troops to each hangar bay and bridge on every single cruiser before a fight begins? It is a huge advantage, and so there are better ways to write this stuff if you actually want it to happen. There are better ways to have Leia killed, and there are better ways to prevent the ship from leaving the cruiser. It is completely rushed and convenient and is made clear when Hux calls Kylo back immediately after the scene since if he was to stay, all of us would wonder why he's not destroying the rest of the fleet. The reason is that the First Order cannot cover their fighters from this distance. Hux's second in command makes a statement about this. They are faster and lighter, but they can't lose us. They are at a range where our cannons are ineffective against their shields, but they won't last long burning fuel like this. That is one hefty line of dialogue to explain the movie. Yes, this line explains the movie. We will now have every plot roll around this central conflict, so let's discuss it. The First Order's goal is to destroy the Resistance. To do this, they need to destroy the remaining fleet. To do this, they need to get in range of their ships in order to fire their cannons effectively. These cannons are ineffective at long range, and so they cannot destroy the Radis unless they are closer. There is no reason for this. The cannons simply behave this way. Since when do missiles or lasers in space lose their effectiveness over distance? especially that short of a distance. On Earth we have bullet drop, we have wind resistance, but you do not have that in space. Regardless, the First Order does not lose their distance despite the Radis being described as faster. There is no reason for this, they just don't. Some have commented that the pilot would have set the speed to simply outrun the First Order narrowly, as anything more is unnecessary. This is a neat explanation, but it is not provided by the movie. Now if this really is the problem, then why aren't the First Order sending their other Star Destroyers through hyperspace to get ahead of the Radis? There is absolutely no reason this isn't happening, it's not mentioned, they just don't do it. But what about the fighters? We saw them destroy the bridge and the hangar, right? And we know that there are bomber-class fighters designed to take a beating and attack the cruisers such as the Radis, right? Where are they? Even the TIE Fighters are able to punch through the shields, but the First Order can't release them due to the fact that they'll be destroyed without cover. They don't explain why this is suddenly an issue when it never has been before in a Star Wars space battle. It simply is an issue now. Can you name me one time where a commander was actually concerned about fighters being destroyed? Remember that the Resistance has no active fighters scrambled because the bay was destroyed. This sets a rule that surface cannons on the side of the Resistance can hit the First Order fighters, but the First Order surface cannons cannot hit the Resistance fighters. There is no explanation for this, it is simply how it works. On top of that, since when is fuel an issue in Star Wars? Not that it can't be, but they've pulled this out of nowhere in order to create a conflict. Not only that, but why, when running out of fuel, would you slow down? On Earth we have bullet drop and wind resistance. You do not have that in space. This is horrendous writing on so many levels, and many claim that you are simply looking too deeply into it when making these observations, because it is very clear that the film is dismissive of all of this itself. This is a terrible perspective to try and have. The film itself is trying to explain many of the elements away. It'll have a full line from the commander to try and explain the plot. It's just badly done. Perhaps with more time and skill it could have been done without the holes being present in almost every element of the setup, but it wasn't. Not to mention that the people who say that, the next time that you have a problem with a film, just think of you saying that to other people. Regardless, Ryan Johnson wants to tell his story, and he has now made huge exceptions in order to have it happen, not to mention taking massive leaps in logic. This is the most common criticism of Star Wars fan fictions especially those in their first draft. So, taking all of these things into account, we have our framing for the story. There is a slow speed chase through space with the Resistance and the First Order, and the Resistance only have a limited amount of time on their side. We then see Leia waking up in space. She makes her way back from the ship and is promptly put on a stretcher. When she does this, she drops the link to Rey and Finn picks it up. This scene is extremely controversial as Carrie Fisher died between production and release of this film, meaning fans have it squarely in their minds when viewing it. Most assumed this would be her exit from the series, but it would seem that this is untouched as a scene from before to after Carrie's passing. The purpose of this whole thing is to put her out of commission and bring in Admiral Holdo, who acts as an antagonist to Poe. But they did this in such a bizarre way. We had no clue that Leia could use the Force in this manner and that is what we're assuming saved her. Many have said that she trained with Luke over the time that we haven't seen her. This explains surviving and the fact that she can force pull herself to safety. But the film did not show us that. The film did not have a character discuss it in passing or blatantly. All we have to go on is Luke saying that Leia has power in episode 6. You have a power I, I don't understand and could never have. You're wrong, Leia. 
You have that power too. This isn't deus ex machina. This is just insulting to the audience. Here is something that you would never have guessed to essentially resurrect a character you were sure to be dead. It makes sense because she would have trained under Luke during the 30 years. Like I said, there's nothing to suggest this at all. A conversation with Luke about her having power does not equate to rigorous training with a Jedi Master in order to survive the vacuum of space. Stop writing the script for him. That's not how the Force works. But for the sake of the argument, let's assume she does have the power and the training required to survive this. Is it a force field? Well, no, because Leia is shown to be frosted when she comes back aboard. In that case, how did Leia survive the vacuum of space? How did she survive the pressure? How did she survive the moisture evaporation? How did she survive the lack of oxygen? How did she survive the temperature? How did she move to the airlock? How did she open the door? How did she get back into the ship instead of being blown back out and taking several people with her? In addition, she couldn't save her colleagues? She let them all die? She let her dear old friend Admiral Akbar die despite his decades of service? I have heard the argument that when a person is in great peril, they will oftentimes have a strong boost of adrenaline. And when you do this for a Jedi, it will give them very impressive power, almost acting as a boost to her force powers. This is ridiculous. Please stop. All of this is terrible. Plenty of things are either butchered or forgotten by Ryan Johnson in order to have his scenes, and it's such a shame. We aren't meant to think about any of this, we're only meant to feel about it. As if emotional investment and immersion are not conducive to each other. It's unexpected, uh, uh, the way it, it turned out. No, I'm gonna go back to sleep, thanks. <laughs> Chewie is then seen trying to eat a porg in front of other porgs and it's played for cuteness and laughs. I know that everyone else is aware of the purpose of porgs within this film, and scenes like this only serve to highlight how utterly sad Chewbacca's existence in this film is. He is meant to react to porgs. He doesn't even speak to Luke beyond being shouted at in the opening scene, and past that he is the driver of the Millennium Falcon. All right, pal. We then see Luke take the dice in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon and meet R2-D2 after all this time. Mark Hamill, for just a moment, is allowed to play Luke Skywalker in this scene. He shows a sense of surprise, happiness, and reverence for the droid, before sinking back into his new character. R2-D2 plays the recording of Leia that we all know so well from the original film, and this prompts Luke to action. This scene is one of the only few that I can actually describe as pitch perfect within the film. Irrelevant of the context, the pieces were all there, the elements were nailed. Though it is so sad to think that this scene is following Chewbacca having a laugh with some animated bird bears. Luke then says to Rey that he will train her and the purpose will be to explain why the Jedi need to end. And then we go back to the fleet. It is explained that Leia will now be inactive until the writers deem it time for her to return as the force power that allowed her to survive space was only good enough to to get her into a coma that lasts a few hours. This is why it's so hard to accept. The force has no limits, while also being restricted. Keeping it simple, keeping it to force pull, force push, force lightning, mind tricks, it was also very understandable. But now it can make protective layers around you. And this isn't even necessarily with training. The film doesn't tell us why any of this is going on. This, this is why people do not want it to be canon, because it is changing or outright breaking rules which is striking directly at our investment within the media itself. And on top of that, the Force can... Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself just yet, we will get to that. So despite all of those issues, Ryan Johnson wants Admiral Holdo to be in charge, and so she is. Holdo says the remaining Resistance members are the spark that will light the fire that will restore the Republic. And I am left to wonder if we would even want the Republic. Considering it was wiped out in minutes and had literally no presence in the universe regardless, why does anyone care to rebuild it? Again, the world development, it just makes this line so hard to swallow. Holdo also says that Admiral Akbar is dead. He was blown out of the ship along with every other major Resistance leader. It would seem that Ryan Johnson was told that the second in the trilogy is the heroes at their low point, and so he decided to simply eject a bunch of characters into space. But this begs the question of just why did you have Admiral Akbar in the movie if you were just going to kill him like this? What is the point of him being in this film? Did you really resurrect a fan favorite meme generator? to just to murder him off screen after a single line of dialogue. Admiral Holdo then tells everyone to man their stations. The character herself is picked on by many for wearing a ball gown and dyeing her hair purple in this film. Now this shouldn't matter all that much because ultimately it is just a hair color and her attire. But the mere fact that so many people have pointed it out should give you an idea of how annoying it is. Why is the Admiral wearing a ball gown? It seems so inefficient and disrespectful. Why does the Admiral have purple hair? 
what is the point of that? I've heard the counter-argument that in the novels supporting the series, Admiral Holdo would dye her hair regularly when she was a young age, so this makes sense. Again, something that the film does not provide and pretends is normal, despite us very rarely seeing anything but natural hair colours on our characters. Poe then comments on the fact that he's heard of Holdo and her past, but he's never seen her before. This would be believable if not for the Resistance being an incredibly small amount of people. Anyway, after Holdo's speech, Poe asks her what her plan is, after explaining that the fleet is in massive danger. She responds very dismissively and asks him about the word plan, as his plan with the Dreadnought has cost the Resistance their fleet. Before I go into the comments she's making there, I want to point out how utterly clunky this dialogue is. Poe asks what the plan is, and she says, Plan? Like the one you had? Poe did indeed have a plan. It was not perfect, but why is this even being discussed? Just answer the question. He is your fleet commander. People respect him. Despite his demotion, nobody else is currently in his place. So tell him your plan. Why did you deflect to this criticism of his methods? Why aren't you behaving like a normal human? Unless she doesn't have a plan, and she's stalling. Maybe she's a double agent. Regardless, this dialogue does not flow. The reason the comment is strange outside of etiquette is that since the bombing fleet was so horribly designed, taking out the Dreadnought was a miracle. A top of the fact that if they hadn't, the Dreadnought would have destroyed them all by now. And then combo that with the fact that if they had all light-speeded out, their entire fleet would be picked off right now because the bombers would be useless. The Dreadnought, the Supremacy, the Star Destroyers and the Fighters would have easy pickings. Finally, in hindsight, Poe made a decision that saved everyone's lives, again, as he has done several times. So stop treating him like a child. This scene is not only an example of poor dialogue, it is filmmaking 101 in terms of setting up a villain. We love Poe, or at least the film hopes we do. He is the hero from the first movie, and a POV character, so when a character so brazenly obstructs him and treats him like a child, we are left to wonder why, and we are naturally pointed in the direction of her being evil, or at the least the antagonist. But it's not over. Poe practically accepts responsibility as well as his diminished rank in what is a sad display of a hero taking a fall for no reason, so that he can ask modestly, what is going on? Holdo then replies, I have known many trigger-happy flyboys like you. You're impulsive, dangerous, and the last thing we need right now, so stick to your post and follow my orders. Once again, where does this kind of response come from? If you genuinely believe that about Poe, then why keep him in the dark? Wouldn't that be the worst thing to do for someone who is impulsive and trigger-happy? What nonsense is this? Holdo biting Poe's head off needs an explanation, and she's almost definitely the villain at this point, but that will simply be a moment for us to think about. The film then introduces Rose. Rose is the sister of the resistance fighter that died in the successful bomber, and so she is mourning her death, which is incredible to think about. A character we have never seen before is mourning another character we only saw once, and neither have had any dialogue, yet we didn't see Luke Skywalker mourn Han Solo. Let that sink in. Rose then catches Finn trying to escape and explains that she's a big fan of him as he's a resistance hero. Considering this movie took place directly after the first, I don't know how the legend spread, but that's fine. Rose explains that she's been taught by her sister to never run away, and that she has to subdue many different people who've been trying to do just that. She's been crippling and capturing people who are trying to save their own lives. Has she been sanctioned by a higher-up to do this? Are people not allowed to leave the resistance at will? This is never discussed. It's almost as if she is doing this regardless of moral implications or orders. Anyway, she catches him trying to escape and zaps him with the taser. When Finn comes to, he tries to explain that the Resistance is going to crumble any time now and he doesn't want Rey to return to this mess. She simply calls him a cowardly traitor. Then Finn explains that they can't escape, and that the First Order can track them, and this turns the conversation around completely. Rose now wants to help Finn find a way to deactivate the tracker, and Finn devises a plan to do it. I was under the impression that Finn simply wanted to escape, run from the First Order and protect Rey. They are his drives, but now he's going to go on a wild banther chase trying to sneak past the First Order and disable their tracker, which isn't possible until he goes to Canto Bight. This sounds as though he wants to do everything he can to protect the Resistance now. On top of that, this shouldn't change that he was a deserter just now, but Rose doesn't seem to care any longer. She's only concerned with taking this coward up on his offer to try and disable a tracker, even if it involves taking a ship and jumping to hyperspace, which is exactly what a coward would want. Not to mention that he says he used to mop the breaker room for the tracker on Snoke's ship, which means that Finn knows about the tracker. So why did he say that tracking through hyperspace is impossible earlier? For those who say that there are no plot holes in this film and that you don't understand what they are, that 
is a plot hole. Besides, I thought Finn was situated on the Starkiller base, not Snoke's ship, as they stated in The Force Awakens. You're telling me that Finn happened to mop the only room we currently need to know the location of in a ship we weren't aware of until this film began? This scene, like the previous one and many others, is an absolute mess. None of this is making sense. It's not following a through line, and more and more questions keep popping up. The script is hemorrhaging. It needs a script doctor, someone to repair the things that are falling apart, as well as someone who is fluent in the lore of the saga, rather than have to demand the audience not to think about any of this. Following that, they tell Poe about their plan. Poe suggests blowing up the Star Destroyer with the tracker on board, being the supremacy. But Finn says they can't because the First Order would simply start using the tracker on another ship, and therefore they need to disable the one that they are actually using and hyperspace out before the First Order realize. This is because it takes six minutes for the First Order to have a system cycle which would reveal the sabotage. As if destroying the supremacy is just something they could do if they wanted. Poe literally just says, oh, you know, we could destroy the supremacy, and Finn says, I like what you're thinking, but that's not going to work. How are you going to destroy the supremacy that easily? How? Not to mention that this means that the First Order has many functioning trackers but chooses to use one instead of coordinating information from multiple trackers. There is no reason for this. And I may be getting ahead of myself here, but there are also no guards on the breaker room, despite it being singularly the most important piece of equipment in their arsenal, in terms of destroying the Resistance. This is also not explained. Poe is very happy to hear about this plan, as you would expect, so he asks Rose and Finn where they met. Rose says it was just luck, and Poe replies, oh yeah? Was it good luck? Why would you ask that? Why, why would anyone ask that? What What do you expect people to say? I don't- why is he saying this? Rose then responds, she isn't sure if it's good luck yet. This line explains why he asked the question in the first place, because it sounds deep. At this point, the script is almost too far gone to bring back. The intentions of the writer come before logic and consistency, with the goals of the scenes being laid bare. You are going to be taken to locations, and you're going to witness events well before you understand why it could possibly take place, because the visuals come before the story. Anyway, C-3PO says that Admiral Holdo will never agree to the plan, and since she has now been established as a villain, Poe decides not to tell her, which is one of the few things that does make sense in this script for now. Also, C-3PO no longer has a red arm. There is no reason for this. I assume that Ryan Johnson forgot that it was red for no reason before, though for as long as it lasted I'm sure it sold a lot of toys that were distinguishable from the OT and the prequel C-3PO. Like seriously, I I'm not even, you know, I'm not even bothered by this, it's, ju it's just so shallow. Anyway, it's not over. Maz Kanata is played by a half Kenyan, half Mexican actress by the name of Lupita Nyong'o, who was celebrated as a casting choice that promoted diversity along with Captain Phasma, Rey, Finn, etc. And since this sequel is taking place with a fleet chasing another fleet in space, there is no way to get her into this film, because Maz Kanata is located in some cantina on some planet, so it's impossible, right? Finn says the entire plan they just came up with point by point is worthless as they can't get into the ship because of its shields. It is actually bizarre that it took this long for him to stop in his tracks and consider this. They've been constructing the plan for ages and he has not brought this up yet. But then Poe decides to call Maz. Why? Did we even see Maz and Poe talk to each other in the other movie? Why wouldn't it be Finn? Is this like a legitimate mistake in the script? Do they forget who met Maz in the first film? Or is this supported by a novel where Poe and Maz are friends? Anyway, Maz is displayed to them on some kind of 360 video call, which isn't explained in any way, but why bother at this point? And Maz explains that she can get them in, but she's too busy with a union dispute, so she recommends using a man she describes in detail and trusts dearly to the point of making a sexually charged joke. Then she literally blasts off and out of the scene and out of the film. Maz Kanata literally pops up for about two or three minutes and I honestly think that this is a diversity quota thing. They had to have her have a scene in the movie. There is no other reason why she's here other than to provide a piece of information that turns out to be absolutely useless in the grand scheme of things. Finn then gives Poe the homing device and this implies to the audience that Finn is doing all of this to save Rey from coming back to the fleet, which is now more in line with his character and more clear. But what is it that we know in totality. The First Order is chasing the Resistance for reasons as we have dissected previously. The fleet must escape. In order to do this, they have to jump to hyperspace. In order to do that, they have to disable the tracker on the lead ship. In order to do that, they have to disable the breaker on the lead ship. In order to do that, they have to break into the lead ship. 
In order to do that, they have to get the Master Codebreaker. In order to get the Master Codebreaker, they have to go to Kanto Bight. And in full, the Codebreaker information is to go to this obscure planet we've never heard of before and find the man at the high-stakes table wearing a white suit and a red rose lapel who is essentially a master at everything because Maz is unavailable. We assume he's simply going to help them out of knowing Maz. This is what it means to be convoluted. The story is now complex and extremely difficult for children to follow despite them being the target demographic. This is on top of the mistreatment of the many characters, the rising unnecessary con conflicts, the absolutely abhorrent dismissal of universal rules, and humour that serves to eat up many of the scenes and their atmosphere. The script is irredeemably mediocre, and we are only 45 minutes into the movie. In fact, I, I want to do movies now where I don't do anything, I don't talk, <laughs> I get second billing, and you know, I'm in the movie less than 30 seconds. Then we move back to Rey as she contacts Kylo Ren through what we can assume is the Force. Kylo says that this can't be Rey's doing as the effort would kill her. She says he will pay. She is clearly grieving for Han Solo. And again we are disjointed tonally by suddenly having a series of frog nun monsters making funny noises. I genuinely find it baffling that Ryan Johnson places extremely lackluster sources of humour in places that are meant to be taken seriously, but he seems to just keep pushing it as if it's some kind of perfect formula. Perhaps the more bothersome part to this, however, is that we're shown grief from Rey. She's talking to Kylo in reference to the murder of Han Solo. And we have Luke, Luke Skywalker, in the background, asking about the hole in the wall she just created, and then saying in an almost humorous tone, What's that all about? Every scene with Luke is a constant reminder that the man who should be broken from the death of Han Solo is chilling out grumpily in the background, commenting on the environment while Rey grieves for Han Solo. So Luke begins his lesson with Rey. She makes a comment about how the Force is something that makes things float and allows you to control people, and Luke disagrees. He has her sit down and meditate after explaining that the Force is in everything and binds everything together. He tells her to reach out, and is disappointed that she tries to do that with her hand, and so tickles her with a reed and tricks her into thinking that it was the force that was doing it. The problem once again is tone. We have this extremely self-contained, self-centered, angry hermit man who begrudgedly accepts to teach Rey about the Force. He is doing that solely to let her know why he will not teach her anything and that the Jedi must end. And then we get some funny jokes. It does not have a consistent flow. How do you want your audience to feel, Ryan? We can only be thankful that we didn't have R2-D2 slip and fall over a porg in the scene that he reunited with Luke, since I'm sure that would have been in the deleted scenes. Rey then talks about the duality of the Force, that she can sense the pro and the con of all the elements on the island. Luke has her describe the Force and then tells her that it does not belong to the Jedi, which is a line I can get behind in terms of development of the lore, but then Luke says, To say that when the Jedi die, the light dies is vanity. Can't you see that? This line doesn't make sense at all. It came out of nowhere. The Jedi are the opposing force to the Sith. To quibble about whether the force is still around if the Jedi aren't is one thing, but he is demanding that we embrace the light without the use of the Jedi. The obvious problem here is the Sith didn't catch the memo. For any of the faults the Jedi have, as well as why Luke has turned his back on them, they have a tendency to fight the Sith, which is incredibly useful when you have mass murdering psychopaths like Kylo Ren and Snoke running around. If Luke wants the disillusion of the light side and the dark side to bring in new thing, fair enough. But removing one side, the side that happens to be positive, is not going to make everything work out. Not to mention that he should know this very well considering his time in the original trilogy. Is he happy to let the Sith just take control of the galaxy and kill the people he loves? Anyway, Rey gets a very sudden approach from the dark side. She says it's cornering her, and Luke tells her to resist it while echoing her name. This is an emotional moment that could have been incredible in a developed story, but this just happens so suddenly. We've had, what, 40 seconds of training, and Luke has already had a moment of seeing Rey's darkness. They got to bond over one tiny joke, and we're already moving along. Luke says she didn't even try to resist the darkness, and Rey responds that she couldn't see Luke, and that she figures out that he has closed himself off from the force. I have no idea what this means, but I suppose it explains why Luke couldn't feel Han's death. As for whatever else it means, we'll have to allow the film to do its thing. Luke responds to her by saying that he has only seen this kind of raw strength in Ben Solo, and that it didn't scare him before, but it does now. I mean, is he saying that Rey and Ben have more power than Vader now? I don't know, moving on. Finn and Rose leave for Canto Bight, and many have pointed out that Finn is the one who is piloting the ship, despite them making it clear that he cannot pilot a ship in The Force Awakens. You need a pilot. I need a pilot. Can you shoot? Blasters I can. Okay, same principle. We need a pilot! We've got one! 
Kill. Use the toggle on the left to switch between missiles, cannons, and mag pulse. Use the sight on the right to aim. Triggers to fire. This is very complicated. This is just another mistake in continuity. Or there's an autopiloting feature going on here, but the film was too lazy to explain that, so you're not going to catch me doing the work for the film. Immediately after that, Ray comes to talk to Chewie after asking him to tell her once the resistance contacts them. But once again, because there is nothing else for Chewie to do, the film has him play with Porgs. Ray then connects to Kylo once again, this time calling him a monster, and Kylo agrees with her, giving her reason to figure out what that might mean. The film also shows us that Kylo has rain on his hand due to the connection, implying that there is some kind of physical presence. It's also a neat detail that Rey enjoys the rain while she's outside since she's from a desert planet and hasn't seen that amount of water, let alone it falling from the sky. And this is the kind of thing that shows me, personally, that this film had potential. A lot of potential. Finn and Rose then arrive in Canto Bight. Rose comments that the place is filled with the worst people in the galaxy, perhaps a reference to Obi-Wan's famous line about the Mos Eisley Cantina. They are then immediately caught out for parking in the wrong space, which will be relevant later. Canto Bight is basically a casino planet filled with creatures that are all fat, disgusting, crazy, and weird while dressing like royalty or at the very least Hunger Games royalty, and there is something sinister going on underneath it all. After BB-8 is used as a slot machine by a local, Rose explains that the First Order took everything from a mining planet that she and her sister grew up on, taking their resources and using their land to test their weapons. She then says that the men and monsters we have seen previously are all rich thanks to selling weaponry to the First Order. Again, with the tonal split of silly BB-8 jokes and suddenly harrowing tales of death and destruction, but... Oh well, more of this soon enough. Immediately after that, Finn and Rose are captured and placed in jail for parking incorrectly just as they found the Master Codebreaker, as Maz Kanata described. Both of them are jailed without sentiment or a time frame because of a parking violation. Right. Also, is it not weird that they left the fleet as soon as possible once they found out about the Codebreaker and they headed to some random planet and it happened to be the perfect time of day to see the Codebreaker in his element rather than sleeping or on vacation or even eating? He's just right there. Lucky. Rey is then seen practicing with her weapon and she decides to use Anakin's lightsaber instead while accompanied by her theme, which is wonderful to listen to, by the way, even if it is only for a few seconds. Luke then begins to watch over her as she loses control and slices the rock that she was training with in half to see it fall down on top of the locals. This is probably the only joke that actually landed in a way that made me laugh out loud, simply by virtue of the expression on these creatures' faces. But had they been any further forward, she would have killed them so it's still a little bit off for me. Rey then goes to talk with Luke and he explains that Jedi are now deified even though their true legacy is failure, citing that at the height of their power they allowed Darth Sidious to rise and wipe them out, as well as Darth Vader being trained and created by a Jedi Master. Rey then turns the conversation by reminding Luke that he saved the galaxy from Vader by turning him back to the light, and he is a Jedi. Luke refers to himself as a legend, then explains the 30 years of history we've all been waiting for. Luke trained Ben in a temple along with many other students, and then he saw darkness within him. One night he confronted him, and Ben buried Luke under a structure. When Luke woke up, his temple was in flames, and his students either left with Ben or were slaughtered. Luke then says he failed because he was a Skywalker. A legend. That's it. That is our full history aside from a tweak or two. And if you think you're going to go into the movie and recapture your childhood, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. It's time to discuss something very important. As you may very well have noticed, I've been showing clips of Mark Hamill and his journey throughout interviews with the press. There is a strong through line that he doesn't like the way Luke was handled in this film. I'm in awe of the entire cast, and aside from Daisy, I look forward to working with them one day. <laughs> Oh, we can't end on that note, can we? I'm afraid we have to, because that is all we've got time for. Um... <laughs> Nor did he appreciate how he was treated, even as far back as The Force Awakens. I got a phone call. You're not on the poster. I said, fine, it's just another in a series of humiliations. I have a massive amount of respect for this man and his clarity when voicing his opinions on Luke and his goals in life of bringing joy while maintaining respect and a form of dignity. He has a strong investment in his work and stays light in most of his appearances to best represent an aged Luke Skywalker to the world. But my point here is that he has a lot of fun. I hate to admit, when I became a Pez dispenser, I ran into Harrison's dressing room and I said, Harrison, I'm a Pez dispenser! And he looked up and he said, Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> he looks like a soccer ball, and he's got the rotating little dome on top. He's adorable. And then you just make it in that sinister dark color with the flat. 
edges on his dome and immediately Nazi he honestly seems to value one thing more than anything else when it comes to Star Wars and that is made very clear here it's it's just so wonderful to be associated with something that makes people so happy and to be associated with anything that brings people that much hap happiness is just a, a real gift and so we have a problem. Luke is a completely different character. Not even the people who love the film disagree with this. The defense always amounts to yes, but it still makes sense. But does it? There is good in him. I felt it. He won't turn me over to the Emperor. I can save him. I can turn him back to the good side. We gotta help her. They're my friends. I gotta help them. I have to try. Get off my island. Does it make sense that Luke Skywalker would give up on training Jedi he worked to resurrect? Does it make sense that Luke Skywalker would give up on the Jedi as a whole despite what he learned about the balance and the actual history that took place in the prequels? Does it make sense that Luke Skywalker would give up on the galaxy he fought so hard to save? Does it make sense that Luke Skywalker would lose every one of his character traits that make him the figure that millions looked up to? Does it make sense that Luke Skywalker would give up on his family? That Luke would abandon them? Does it make sense that Luke Skywalker became became a fearful coward, a hermit man, a tired, grumpy, old, damp sock, asking that we allow him to run away so he can be alone and die. Maybe we shouldn't be asking whether it makes sense. Let's ask Mark what he thinks. When I read Seven, I said, I love everybody's part except mine. <laughs> Imagine how I felt, because I'm reading this thing, everybody's talking about me all through the movie, and then I get to my part and I turn the page and it says the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> did your vision and Ryan's vision, did it coincide with the way that Luke ends up in this film that, that you thought it would all these years later? No. No, not at all. It's, it's, it was a shocking to me uh, to read what Ryan had written as I'm sure it will be for the audience. I said to Ryan, I'm so surprised how you see Luke. I was shocked, because I said to Ryan, number one, Luke was the most optimistic, hopeful character, and now he's this miserable, you know, despondent uh, hermit. Now you've seen in the new trailer, Luke says it's time for the Jedi to end, and that's terribly shocking. Yeah. I thought, I don't want to go there. I want to be the optimistic, hopeful one like before but yeah luke was the most optimistic hopeful character and yes. uh, i had a real uh, you know sort of a back and forth with ryan i said ryan a jedi doesn't give up i remember you saying that yeah, you yeah, know yeah. a jedi if he does something wrong he makes it right you know even if he's traumatized and goes away he re regroup within well, i don't know six months but <laughs> i don't believe a jedi would ever give up okay. you see i if he makes a mistake he doubles down and does the right thing regardless of the the magnitude of his mistake. Who is this guy? How did the most optimistic, hopeful character in the galaxy turn into this hermit who says it's time for the Jedi to end? I, I read that and I said, what? I mean, that's not what a Jedi does. How, what I thought was I was a nice, nurturing, in my mind, I was a, a, a great uncle to, to Ben Solo, and uh, I feel tremendous guilt. Uh, that I wasn't uh, there for him. I used to be the orphan discovering hidden powers. Now we've got this one. I used to be the hotshot, impulsive ex-wing fighter. Now we've got Oscar. I used to be the one sneaking around enemy territory in disguise. Now we've got Rose and Finn. So, you know, I had to fight the irrational urge that it's a bunch of strangers rummaging through my old toy box playing with my toys. <laughs> I almost had to think of Luke as another character. Uh, maybe he's Jake Skywalker. He's not my Luke Skywalker. Luke has been gutted and poached in order to function as a springboard for the new heroes. He is the husk they will emerge from. Rey is better than Luke. She is more powerful, more morally righteous, more ambitious, more thoughtful, kinder. She's everything he should have been. But Luke actually earned those traits traits and now they belong to her for free no training no tests no trials no tribulation luke has been provided a very classic case of character assassination and it's devastating for longtime viewers because not only is it something that we don't want to see but it has given no meaningful or developed reasoning none of this makes sense i remember thinking uh when i got to the scene i hope everyone's seen it but when the lightsaber jiggles in the forest and flies out of the snow i went oh baby here i am goes to Ray. <laughs> I'm saying she didn't even do any training. What's going on here? Steve, what is going on there? Uh, well, she didn't do any training. Well, How could she possibly stand up? Well, <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't even been to take up of her training. <laughs>
What's the deal? I know, everyone said. <laughs> Mark has since tried to pull back on his comments as they are functioning as a springboard of their own for fans to rally behind. Comments he only meant to make as an expression of his feelings, and it's caused massive splits in the fan base as well as vitriolic comments and tweets. Mark's tweets are often referenced as evidence that Mark loves the new film and the direction it takes, but after seeing each of the interviews, I think in the spirit that he wants people to be happy, he is simply trying to calm the storm, calm everyone down, despite his own personal disdain. You can see him in moments of great stress and anxiety across the internet, but there is one interview that is very telling to me. It almost tells a story of Mark Hamill and Luke Skywalker. Mark isn't simply attached to Luke because it's a great source of financial stability. He loves what he and the character brought to people all over the world. Joy and hope. Wonder and escapism. Happiness. And so when faced with this new direction, the dark, gritty, depressed, sallow coward, there aren't many ways to feel about it other than the need to get away from it. So during this clip, Mark is once again veering off into his own thoughts, and we can only speculate what they might be about in this Star Wars-related interview. Regardless, this interview is between Mark Hamill and Britain's own Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg is a massive original trilogy fan, and as they discuss the topics at hand, watch Mark slowly fade off and away until he is reminded by Simon Pegg of why Luke Skywalker is so important. But uh, I've been a fan of Mark since I was seven. So All right, there you go. And, um, you know, he, he was such a huge part of my life growing up and part of my, you know, development as a person because that, I know it sounds crazy, and it's weird when people talk about things that you've done as being so influential and, uh, you know, having such an effect, but it, Star Wars had a big effect on me, you know, mm. and, and I always was Luke in, in the playground. I was always, <laughs> you know, he's always my favourite. And yeah. so to, to meet him on that first day, I remember you came in and you were like, you know, he was sort of on set saying hi, and I kind of, I think I went up and hugged you straight away. Really? It's that odd thing, I know you, I've known you for 30 seconds. Yeah, years. that's the amazing thing about this, is that you become a part of the world's yeah. family. And I'm so moved by stories of people that were inspired, people that really are facing like health issues and adversities that find uh, determination uh, and, and, and spiritual redemption. I'm just... I, I am always stunned at how it affected people and continues to affect them. This is pretty devastating. Because who wants to play as the old grumpy man on the island who wants to die? Who's going to be inspired by that? Not Mark Hamill, I can tell you that much. The other reason people think he's walked back on his statement is that his arm would have been twisted by Disney. But we have no reason to assume that, do we? But um, uh, you'll find out more... Uh, I don't think anyone will ever say, that's exactly what I wanted. And I better be careful, by the way. I had to do what Ryan wanted me to do because it, it serves the story well. But uh, listen, I still haven't accepted it completely. I mean, if I leaked something, they'd cut off my head and throw it right in my face. <laughs> Seriously, though, I think he's walked back on them to try and keep the peace. The man does not want to cause or support pain in any way. And besides, should we take him seriously on Twitter? I, I you know, I, I, I mean, it's only a joke, you know. I, don't take me seriously. I'm just another crank on Twitter. See what I mean? He's just fun, and he was forced to play literally the opposite of that. Anyway, the fact that Luke has been butchered, as many iconic characters have been with every reboot that gets released, plenty of people still like the direction, but regardless of how they feel, regardless of how Mark feels, regardless of how the world feels, I feel like it was a terrible decision from a man who had a fan story to tell and no one could convince him of anything different because he had the final word on the script. As nightmares do sometimes come true, that fan fiction is now canon. Thank you for watching part one of my series. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know this is intense, it's long, and it's packed with loads of stuff, and it's honestly experimental. I've not actually done a movie on my channel before, but I can see that you're all very interested to actually get my perspective on it thanks to the, uh, the first video. Let me know what you think was done right, or what you think has been done horribly wrong. I should be able to reply to a bunch of you folks in the comments, and we can have a great time. Now, I usually complete my series and release them two days apart from each other in terms of the parts, but I consider this a sort of of special circumstance, so what I'm doing now instead is condensing all of the parts that would have existed into a smaller amount, so instead of something like 10 or 11, we have three. These three are going to be longer, as you could probably tell by watching this video. However, they will be released weekly. So exactly a week from now, you can expect part two, and then a week from then, you can expect part three. Thank you for watching, folks, and I will see you next time.
because The Force Awakens made a lot of money, I can't be, it's, doesn't, it's not ergo, it's good. All I'm saying is I've never met anybody that's my age or probably even your age that say, oh, I love that movie. You know, most people are disparaging of that, that particular franchise, but they keep making them because they make huge amounts of money. Because in Hollywood, remember, kids, it's not important if it's of high quality. Only if it makes money. 